Hello YouTube, this is Crazy Dave. Not at the range, I'm actually at home, enjoying the warmth. The <laughs> uh, reason why I'm here tonight is I'm going to go over a rifle that's new to me, and it's my Norinco T97 Gen 3. Now if you don't have one of these rifles, get one. They're well worth the money. Uh, I have footnotes that I'm going to go over to keep everything on track. I used to have the Gen 1 version that I had to cut the front post and the rear side off to mount the flat top upper and I put a lower handguard on it and I liked it, it worked well but the problem I found were the mags would fit tight in the mag well and they wouldn't drop free, they were fairly stiff functionable but fairly stiff to get in and out and uh, I ended up selling it and I missed it so much I went out and bought another one and the other one I bought was the same uh, Gen 1 version but it came with a flat top and the Magwell for some reason seemed to accept the mags a little bit better that's the one you see in my videos where I do uh, 2500 rounds and in the 2500 rounds I had one that was a failure to feed and it pushed a bullet into the shell and that was only the one round out of the 2500 probably because it was real cheap ammo uh, so I was really happy with that rifle it functioned well I had no problems with it really and uh, I heard that Norinco was making changes and I'll go over the changes on this rifle soon but one of the big changes they made was the magwell and the feed ramp because the gen 1 was wasn't famous but there were people that were having jams and misfeeds and uh, it was very finicky as to what kind of magazine you could put in it and the changes they made solved that problem so they came out with the gen 2 and the Gen 2 looks identical to the Gen 3. Looks identical to it. Uh, the only difference that I can see between the Gen 2 and the Gen 3, if you look here, I don't know how well you'll, you'll see it, but if you look right here, these have M-lock uh, slots and the Gen 2 had key mod. Now the problem with key mod is if for some reason uh, this gets jarred and slides back the bolts that bolt the picket in the rail would end up in the large circle of the keyhole and fall off whereas the M-lock it's the same size all the way along so if it, this does happen to slide back I'm not going to lose it. So when I heard that the Gen 3 came out with the um, slots here I decided okay I really want that because of the improvements they made and the M-lock slots so I sold the second one that I had and sold it for what I paid for it so I didn't lose any money and I was able to get this one I think I put another hundred dollars towards this one so I'm not really out much another thing is when the Gen 2 came out they came out for roughly uh, I think it was fourteen or fifteen hundred dollars. The Gen 3 here now goes for eleven ninety nine. So they've actually lowered the price, which is nice. And to me, this is now almost perfect, and I'll explain that in a while. Okay, to go over the features of this, uh, <coughs> this is the Norinco uh, T97 Gen 3. If you don't have one, get one. They're a really, really good rifle. It's a short piston gas operated system. And if you look in the front here, I don't know how well you'll see it, but right here they have a selector for the gas system. It has a 1, a 0, and a, a 2. The 1 is for regular use. The 0 
you it won't recycle so you physically have to charge it every time you pull the trigger on the zero turns it kind of like into a bolt action instead of semi-auto and then the two is for when it gets fouled or you have adverse weather conditions that's jamming things up it applies more gas to your bolt so you know it, it, it kind of compensates uh, this is chambered in 5.56 NATO which means you can use the 5.56 or the 223. It comes with the flip up iron sights, front and rear. I obviously can't flip up the rear one because of the scope here. Uh, they're steel. Uh, the barrel length is 18, uh, 18 and a half inches. It's chrome lined. The twist rate is. 1.7 the trigger pull which is what I really am impressed with first you have to take the magazine out because uh, the bolt automatically automatically stays locked open with an empty mag it has an auto bolt open on it the trigger pull we'll charge it first to show you it's not loaded it's pointing in a safe direction the magazine that I just took out of it is empty the trigger is written, let me use the other hand so you can actually see it a little better. The trigger is really smooth. The reset isn't overly long, but again the trigger is really smooth. The reset is audible and tactile, and bull pups are notorious for long trigger pulls, and the reason for that is there's a linkage that runs from your trigger all the way back to where the hammer is in the back here because the bullpup all the action is behind the pistol grip and that's why the mag loads here uh, so for a bullpup I guess it's average but the trigger is really really smooth and it's only four and a half pounds now the weight of this rifle is 8.6 pounds so it's just a little bit heavier than the Tavor it's about the same as an AR uh, but it's much better balanced the balance point point of this rifle is uh, right at the pistol grip it's, it's not front heavy or back heavy which makes it feel a lot lighter than the Tavor and makes it more comfortable to shoot as far as I'm concerned but we'll get into this versus to, to four later uh, the Gen 3 obviously comes with a flat top and it runs at a Picatinny rail uh, the full length of your upper and it's aluminum so it's not plastic it won't uh, flex which makes your mounting surface very rigid <coughs> the charging handle is not reciprocating I'll put this back in so I can show you it's not reciprocating it's free floating so once it's in place this doesn't move backwards and forwards to bang your knuckle another note is this rifle came with the charging handle on the right side there's a bolt here at the front and a bolt at the back you have to take off your steel sights you undo those bolts the whole top piece comes off and you can get to the charging handle it doesn't even take five minutes to switch it over which is nice so you can set it up the way you like uh, every T97 comes, now I don't know if I'll be able to do this or not, but in the bottom of your pistol grip, there's a little button that you push. I'm doing it with my thumbnail. You can do it with your thumbnail or bullet or whatever. And the bottom plate slides off. Now once you get the bottom plate off, there's a little container that has 
tools in it. Now I don't know how how well you'll be able to see that, but it comes with uh, different rods and stuff so you can clean the gun. It's nice and handy, it's right in the pistol grip. Now when you're putting the plate back on, the part that's indented faces out and the part that's flat goes in. So you take the flat part and uh, push down on the button and slide it in. It's that simple. Not hard to do. Uh, the flash hider that it comes with, again I don't know how well you'll see it, but the flash hider right here is pin welded. Uh, and they've made modifications to the safety latch which is way in the back here it's taller so it's easier to actually turn and use but it's still in the very back which I don't like <coughs> another one of the big modifications they made was the original Gen 1 series when you finish shooting and you want to change your mags you had to twist and reach through here and find a little button with your finger and push it in to get the mag out. I don't know how well you'll see it, but right here is a little button. It's very small and you have to push it fairly hard, a lot harder than you would on an AR. So you ended up twisting it and pushing that button in to get the mag out. Which wasn't hard to do, but it was awkward. The changes they've made to the Gen 2 and the Gen 3 is on the other side. Again, I don't know how well you'll see it. Where is it? Right? Right here. It's a lever. And you just push a lever and your mag falls out. So they've made the mag release ambidextrous. So instead of reaching like this now, all I have to do is hit this with my thumb and it comes out much easier to access, much easier to use. The trigger, like I said, I can't believe how smooth it is. There's absolutely no grip whatsoever. Not much of a wall to feel, but absolutely smooth. It's probably the smoothest trigger I've felt, especially standard on a gun. Uh, Another one of the big changes, which I've mentioned lightly, is they've reshaped the magwell here. Like I said, the Gen 1, some of the magazines were stiff. Uh, some people had problems with not accepting mags at all, like different types of mags. Um, they've reshaped the magwell so it will accept all kinds of Stanag mags. I've used, obviously, the magazine it came with. I've used uh, Magpul Gen 3, I believe it was called, plastic mags. I've used uh, the steel 10 round mags. I've used the LAR plastic 10 round mags. I've used the Cross, or what is it called? Cross Industries 10 round mag. Obviously, GI mags. I've had no problems putting mags in and out. Some of them don't drop free, but they're not hard to get in. They, they, they go in smooth, they come out smooth. So they've obviously made improvements to the mag well. In addition to that, like I said, inside here, uh, the Gen 1s, people were having problems with it jamming and not feeding right and ejection problems. They've reshaped the feed ramps and the bolt face so that eliminates that problem now I've only gone through 250 rounds and these haven't been around long enough so far to have a really good track record but this has given me absolutely no problem so that should solve the problem of uh, misfeeds and ejection problems <coughs> They've also redesigned the gas port, which is this little part that you take out here uh, in the size of the hole. So 
so it actually functions better. Um, the, another thing they did is the spring on the piston on the Gen 1 was exposed. So dust and uh, debris and stuff could affect it, whereas now it's in a tube to keep dust and, and all kinds of stuff out of it. Again, increasing the functionality of it. Uh, the field strip on these guns are phenomenal. Just like the Tevor, you have one button back here. Let me put it on safe first because I don't want it to fly open. You push this button, you pull it out. Now keep in mind this part is spring loaded, so when you pull it out, it'll fly. Oh, I guess I put it on fire, it did come out. It'll fly apart. This upper part here has, I don't know how well you'll see it, but it has a little part here that pivots. That's to help in the dampening. I'm going to try to get this back in place. This spring is your buffer spring, and this whole piece. can slide out. So to take it out, you pull it out. This is your your uh, bolt, rotating bolt. I just changed that, didn't I? Oh, it's because it has a mag in there. <laughs> That's what the problem is. Should have done it without the mag. So this slides in. Then you take this part, and it it slides on here and here. This is these are rails, and this is grooved. So you have to get the grooves in place. Slide this in. You have to pull the trigger to get it past there. Put it on safe. And that stops it flying out. That's what I meant to do in the first place, but with the magazine in, it didn't do its job. This now you rest on here, slide it in, Whoop. push that in, and you're good to go. So you literally pull one pin, this part comes out, the whole gut slide out, and then you can get into your barrel and that. The gas port, like I said, you turn this all the way flat. I'm not going to take it out but flat and when it's flat this can be pulled out and that's how you get to your piston. Uh, so it's very very simple um, field strip that you do. Very simple. A lot simpler than the Tavor which we'll get into later. The action that you're actually using to load in that is extremely, not only is the trigger smooth, but the action is extremely smooth. Fire to go all the way back. Really, really smooth. Not gritty at all. And very, very smooth. Uh, the ejector port Pull it back. You can lock it open by pushing your finger in the back here and pushing up on a lever, and that will lock it open. But you eject the port here. When the shell gets ejected, it gets ejected with such force that well, I've heard people make a comment. It almost launches it back to China, which it kind of does, right? Uh, one guy actually mentioned he thinks. The shell comes out faster than the bullet comes out the other end, <laughs> you know, but it really comes out fast. In fact, it'll shoot it out roughly a 40 degree angle, like a two o'clock position, and it'll shoot it out all oh, 15, 20 yards. It's insane how far the brass flies. But because 
it flies at a 40 degree angle. Uh, Norinko has said they made it that way specially so that it wouldn't be going sideways and hitting comrades in the face. It's designed to get the hell out of there without hitting other people in the face. And uh, it comes out with such force it actually dents the shells. So if you're thinking of getting one of these rifles and you want to reload your 223 or your 5.56, it's not going to happen. The shell actually gets dented, so you can't reuse it. Uh, this is a right handed only weapon. For the main reason, when, you have, when you're shooting it, your head is way up here like this. The gas port is right by where your mouth is going to be. So if you're to shoot it left handed and you have your eye on your sight, the ejection port's right here. So it's going to split your lip wide open. Now I suppose if you put your, your face further back, because it comes that way out, it can be shot left-handed. Left I've done it. I've, I've shot it on my weak side around barricades and that. And it, you definitely get a much stronger smell of propellant <laughs> and kind of blow back in your face. But it is possible to shoot it like this left-handed. Not really recommended, but if you had to, you can. So this is really a right-handed only uh, weapon. You cannot change over to the other side. Uh, sling attachments. This comes with two, one in the back and one in the front. It's on the left-hand side. And when it's in there, it makes a gun fit real flat against your body. It's really nice. So if you're running through a bush or going over logs or what have you, and it's unsafe obviously, it lies absolutely flat against your body, which is nice. I, on the other hand, <coughs> this pin here, normally, you just push a pin and pull it out and you can get the lower off. What I've done, I don't know if I have one of those pins here or not, think so. I got a push pin from the hardware store and it comes all the way out. It's longer than the one that's on the gun and I've drilled a hole through it so I can actually put a swivel single point sling on here. So if you see the video with this having a, a single point sling, that's how I got to do it. Uh, they're not hard to do. You just have to make sure the push pin this push pin is 5 sixteenths of an inch wide. So make sure if you're getting one, it's minimum 5 or maximum 5 sixteenths because this fits real snug. <coughs> and make sure the head of it is small enough to go into this indent. And you push it in, mark where you want to uh, drill the hole, and make sure the hole is big enough the little pin of this swivel here and then cut just above the hole that you just made so that this can actually swivel because there's not much room between the pin and the top here so if this part is too long above the hole that you just made this will buck it won't it won't swivel but that's basically how you do it I've had a lot of people ask me how do you get a single point sling on it that's how I did it and I, any rifle that I get that doesn't come with one, that's what I end up doing. In fact, I have a shotgun that I changed the normal stock to a pistol grip type. And I drilled the hole all the way through and I've done the exact same thing to it. Because I personally prefer a single point sling over a double or a triple, that's just me personally. Uh, but you have not eliminated the, the points for you to make a two-point sling and now with this third point here you could actually convert it to a three-point sling if you wish okay now in the video that I made about this uh, rifle I made a comment that I dare to say and I, I stick by it I dare to say that I prefer this to the Tavor I know a lot of Tavor owners are going to get upset and a lot of people are going to scream 
it's kind of like when you insult a Glock. Here, let me go over the details as to why. There's quite a few reasons why I prefer this to the Tavor. A, it's not as bulky back here. So when you're shouldering it, it feels a lot more comfortable because you've gotten rid of all that bulk that the Tavor has. Secondly, uh, it's half the price of the Tavor. Like I said, this comes in at $11.99. You throw the lower handguard on here, you're still just a little over half the price of the Tavor, meaning you can buy two of these for the price of the Tavor. If you throw a Geithley trigger in a Tavor, because the Tavor trigger is nowhere near as nice as this, and you increase the value of the Tavor, you can literally get two of these with the lower handguard, making it perfect for the price of one Tavor. That's something to think about. Uh, it's better balanced than the Tavor. The Tavor tends to be a little front heavy. So if you're holding the rifle, it tends to want to do that. So you end up putting a little pressure backwards to, to keep it up straight. So if you're holding it for long periods of time, your forearm ends up getting a little achy because you're constantly fighting the want of it going forward because it's front heavy. This balance point is exactly on, I'm not really, I'm just steadying, but the balance point is exactly on the pistol grip. So you can literally just hang this and hold it without any strain whatsoever. So it's better balanced and feels, because it's better balanced, feels a lot lighter than the Tavor. Even though it's not, it feels a lot lighter than the Tavor because you're not lifting that one thing to go forward. To me, this is way more reliable than the Tavor. The Tavor likes to be shot wet, as they say, or, or well-oiled. The problem I find with the Tavor, and I'm speaking from experience, is when it dries out, like after 50, 60 rounds, and it starts drying out, you end up getting misfeed problems, ejection problems. This gun can be shot wet, dry, dirty. It doesn't matter. This gun is brand new to me. I've only had it a few days. I've gone through 250 rounds without a hitch. There's no need to re-oil it. There's no need to change the gas block position, it shot flawlessly, and probably still would for another 250. Now I clean my guns after every use. I don't believe in uh, torture tests and foolish things like that, where you're subjecting guns to conditions it wouldn't normally operate under. It's foolish and it's dangerous. Now I'm not talking about people that, like nothing fancy for example, will go out in the desert where it's real dusty and everything, and he will shoot hundreds of rounds. There's no problem with that. I'm talking about people that throw it in the mud, step on it, drag it behind vehicles, throw it in swamps. That kind of torture test is not only foolish, but it's dangerous. And you're, you're subjecting guns to conditions you wouldn't normally be operating under. Anyway, that's enough of that. So it's more reliable, better balanced, and half the price. Mags will load. What do I do with that mag? Mags will load on a closed bolt. Whereas the Tavor, you really have to slam it in and it, it, it's a little finicky when it comes to loading a, a loaded mag on a closed bolt. This will accept all kinds of magazines. All kinds, the Gen 3 will. The Gen 1, maybe not so much, but the Gen 3 will accept all kinds of mags, whereas the Tavor tends to be a little finicky as to what mag it will take. It's easier to feel strip. The trigger on this is much, much better than the Tavor. Like I said, this is a four and a half pound trigger. The Tavor I had was closer to 10 pounds. There's a guy on YouTube that says his trigger was 22 pounds. I can't see it being that much, but anyway, I know mine was a lot heavier and it was gritty. 
So the trigger on this is a much, much better trigger than what comes on the Tavor. Now I know, I know you can buy Geisley triggers and stuff for the Tavor, but now you're upping the price of the Tavor even more because that's like a three, four hundred dollar trigger. Uh, this has an adjustable gas block so that when you shoot it continuously and it starts to get fouled, you can actually put more gas to your bolt, which increases its reliability. Like I said, because it feels lighter, it's much, much more comfortable to shoot in the war, partic particularly when you don't have that big bulk here. And everything about it is smoother. The trigger is smoother, the cocking action, oops, I forgot I had that mag in there. The cocking action is smoother. Now I know on it of war to uh, you put a new mag in and you just hit back here to release the bolt. Well this is very similar just so you don't reach way back there. Right? This will be back. So you put your mag in and your hand is very close to where you want it to be. You just flick it with your fingers. It's not hard. It doesn't take much pressure. So it's just as quick to release a bolt on this as it is on the Tavor. It's just in a different spot, but just as quick. So those are the main reasons why I prefer this to the Tavor. I don't think it's worth spending twice the money for something that doesn't have as many advantages over this as this does over the Tavor. I like to say you can get two of these for one Tavor. So that's just my opinion. I'm not saying whether it's a better gun or a worse gun. That me personally, I prefer this to the Tavor. That's just my opinion. Take it for what it's worth. Uh, another thing you'll notice on this gun is I have my name. <laughs> and there's a little story behind that. I was shooting, I believe it was a GSG-15, not the competition version, just a regular GSG-15. I had it and a few other guns at the range. And I was shooting one of the other guns, and there was a guy beside me with a GSG-15, and he even commented, Boy, that gun looks exactly like this one. And it did. It, he had his setup the exact same way I had mine set up. If you were to put the two of them side by side, you could not tell whose was whose. Anyway, I was shooting my guns after we had a little discussion about that. And he continued shooting. And at the end of his day, he grabbed his gun, said goodbye, and left. Gone. But when I got to shoot the GSG-15, I noticed something wasn't right. It, it was off. It just wasn't as accurate as I remembered. It's, I mean, it was, it was obviously my gun, but something was, it just wasn't right. Now, like I say, after every time I go to the range or whenever, wherever, I end up cleaning the gun and going over it with a fine tooth comb to make sure it functions right and everything is as it should be. When I pulled it apart, I realized the rifling in the barrel was wearing and there was a few pits and that on the head of the bolt and the ejector was wearing. So obviously it wasn't my gun because my gun was fairly new. <laughs> so what had happened is this guy had taken my gun home. He's probably quite happy because he has a fairly new gun and left me with junk. So I know you can get barrels and bolts and stuff for it but I said no what I'll do is I'll sell it. So I sold it and I got another one, but it was a competition version, which is what you see in the, vi the videos now. And I love the gun, I've had no problems with it. But because of that, I now put my name on every rifle that I have. Uh, just so that at a glance, if someone's leaving, I can tell whether it's my gun or not. So I have my name on this side, and I have a Punisher skull on the side of all my rifles. Just so, when someone's leaving, I can quickly glance over and know, hey, buddy, you have the wrong gun. You know what I mean? So it's a little uh, personal history lesson there. <laughs>
And uh, of course on pistols I don't because they're usually on my side. But I have the Punisher skull on my holster. But uh, I know this is kind of long. Uh, thanks for listening to me. I hope this has helped you out. It's uh, about it for me tonight. I hope you enjoyed this video. I certainly enjoyed bringing it to you. Even with a little history lesson. Uh, please keep an eye on the channel. I have other guns. I have a JRC carbine that I'll be going over. Uh, a couple other guns. So keep an eye on the channel. And uh, there'll be more like this coming to you in the future. Don't forget to like, subscribe, or share. And forgive me when it takes so long between guns to do reviews. But the reason for that is everything I do comes out of my pocket. All the ammo that I use, I pay full price for. I don't get any discounts. I don't get any uh, donated to me. I don't have any sponsors of any kind. So all the expenses come out of my pocket, even with the guns. I don't get any donated, I don't get any sponsored, I don't get any discounts. So any gun that you see me review is at my cost. They're my personal guns. If I like them, I keep them. If I don't like them, I sell them and move on. So it's very expensive. I can't afford, like this gun is $1,100. I can't, I can't afford to just throw $1,100 out. So that's why my videos are so far apart. And uh, because I have no sponsorship, nothing to fall on to, to, to do videos. Nobody lending me guns. You know, it, it's all at my expense. But I hope this has helped you. Like I say, please like, subscribe, or share. And particularly if you have any experience with these guns or any other guns that I review, leave a comment below. I'm always interested in how people find these guns that I review, whether they've had problems with it, uh, whether they uh, need, need to find a fix. Maybe I can help them uh, fix it, find a solution. Uh, plus it keeps the firearm community knowledgeable. In, in what you found and, and, and so forth. Anyway, thanks again. So I'll be signing out and I know this video is kind of long, but thanks again.